Hi, welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video is going to be the second video in a series in which we'll be exploring the phenomenological ontology of Jean-Paul Sartre, a famous French existentialist. Okay, so in the first video we looked basically at two themes, the first of which had to do with his idea that existence precedes essence. In other words, that we're in the world first, and only on that basis do we come to some understanding about what that means. For instance, why is it that we, well not we, but many of us uh, believe in God? Well, from the point of view of Sartre's phenomenology, we end up believing in God as the ultimate creator of life, the universe, and everything, including our own human nature, because we experience the world in a particular way, and because we experience the world in a particular way, it makes it easy and inviting for us to choose to believe in God. So it's not as though God is actually the a priori thing that's somehow out there, transcendent to the world that has created us and created our nature too. It's more like that we experience life in a particular way, and because we experience life in a particular way, we end up believing in God. Same is true of the empirical sciences and the truths and principles of the empirical sciences. We end up believing in those ultimately because we experience the world as we do. And because we experience the world as we do and because it's shaped and conditioned by things like the Western cultural and historical trajectory, we end up believing in force equals mass times acceleration or E equals MC squared or PV equals NRT, that's the ideal gas law from chemistry. But it's only on the basis of our subjectively experiencing things as we do that we end up believing in some kind of objective scientific account of reality. So in a way, our belief in God is not that different in principle from our belief in a secular scientific cosmology. And maybe that second one is a little tougher to see. So uh, maybe uh, let's remember back maybe when you took chemistry at some point in your life and you were investigating the equation PV equals NRT, the ideal gas law. And uh, because most chemistry programs end up putting you in a laboratory situation, not because they think that you'll discover some new chemical principle, but they want you to enter the spirit of empirical inquiry and see for yourself whether PV does indeed equal NRT. So they set you up in a laboratory and you conduct experiments and hopefully your experiments are, you do them correctly and they end up confirming uh, whatever principle it is you're interested in confirming. Well, the thing about those laboratory situations, whether they're in your class or whether you're on the cutting edge of science is this, that they're always based upon the phenomenon of observation. In order to investigate reality scientifically, you're always going to have have to be observing something. That's at the soul and it's the animating spirit of empirical inquiry in the first place. You don't just base your assertions upon uh, your opinion or what, what you feel like that particular day. Instead you go into the laboratory and observe things and only on that basis do you end up asserting scientific principles. Well, the thing about doing all that is that it's based upon the phenomenon of observing things. But when you think about it, the process of observing things is itself a very subjective thing. Ultimately, in one way or another, it's based upon the subjective experience of perceiving things as we do. Hence, observing things as we do. So the whole edifice of the natural sciences ultimately is based upon a foundation, if you want to use that word, of a subjective experience that there too, like we're in the world first. We experience the world first as we do and only then do we end up thinking things like, well, PV really does equal NRT or E uh, really does equal MC squared or F really does equal MA. <laughs> You know, you probably can tell that I've had a scientific background at some point. I started out as a biochem major and then did a couple degrees in computer science and mathematics along the way. So I have contact with that way of seeing things. But, you know, it's a sort of startling insight if you're just sort of a, a fervent believer in a kind of, you know, sci monolithic scientific monism as an explanation of life, the universe, and everything to realize that, well, underneath our entire vision of what objectivity is, is this layer or this, this uh, what, like substratum of subjective experience in the form of observation.
All right, so that's a way, I guess, of elaborating on the idea of existence preceding essence. And then uh, in the last video, we also looked at factical freedom. So the idea there was that, well, all the things that we do not choose are always how we experience those things and how we uh, live those sorts of elements of our lives are always uh, interwoven with our choices, okay? So there's no such thing as a bare facticity. Like, it's always up to you how you experience the facticity of being in your particular body, let's say, with all of its attributes, its strengths and weaknesses and so on. Like, the fact that you cannot just with a snap of your fingers just choose to be in someone else's body doesn't mean that you're not free, okay? So freedom, what we choose, and what we do not choose are always interwoven with each other. And I glossed that in the last video by quoting Sartre and saying, freedom is what we do with what's been done to us, okay? So, which I think is a fairly pithy uh, way of getting at that idea of factical freedom. Okay, so that's all stuff from the last video. Those of you who are my students are probably familiar with the fact that I usually spend the first few minutes of every lecture summarizing some main points from the previous one. So uh, for you guys, that's sort of business as usual. But let's get to some new stuff, okay? So I'm cycling forward through your notes a little bit to page, uh, what page is this? I think it's page three of your notes. And, uh, okay. All right, so we may not have the latitude to choose what cards de uh, life deals us, but how we play them is completely up to us. Once again, this is a description of factical freedom. So not even God or our own, quote, human nature, nor the happenstances of life determine us. We really are radically free. And remember in the last video, I glossed that word radically as to the root, and that's from the Latinate etymology of the word. Consequently, uh, he says, man or humanity, we could update the gender language, I suppose, a little bit. Humanity is nothing else but what it makes of himself. Our lives are nothing else but what we make of them. Such is the first principle of existentialism. That's on page 36 of your book. Okay, now here's the real new stuff. Most of the choices we make, most of the way our freedom expresses itself in our lives is pre-reflective in nature. Okay, so this is going to be a very important point. So most of our choices, most of the things we choose, we're not aware of choosing. Okay, it's before we reflect, before we're aware of practicing our freedom. The vast majority of our choices in this life are like that. And I gave you a little example in your notes. It's like, you know, you drive home, let's say, after class. Suppose, theoretically, you're not in a corona lockdown quarantine situation. And so after class, excuse me, after class, uh, you decide to drive home. And you probably do it like I do, uh, in a fairly automatic fashion. You just sort of, you know, you remember your car, as you walk to your car, you put your stuff in the car, you start the car, you start driving, and um, probably you drive, if you're like me, you probably drive the same way home pretty much every time. And uh, really, um, it doesn't seem like you're choosing any of that. It seems like you're sort of on autopilot in a sense, you know, but the fact of the matter is when you reflect on that experience, uh, the fact of the matter is that, well, at any and all points, you could have chosen to take a different way home. At any and all points, in fact, as you were walking to your car, at any point in your walking to your car, you've decided, you could have decided you're not going to take your car at all. You could have decided you're going to call a taxi or you could decide uh, you're going to walk uh, home instead of, uh, you know, uh, driving. And okay, like the distance between my house and the university is seven miles, uh, but I can walk seven miles. You know, that's not, I'm an old runner from way back when, so that's not that big a deal for me. Um, uh, and probably not for you either, because most of you are young and strong and tough and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, Wow, I guess uh, in what seemed to be a very automatic process where I was not aware of making choices, insofar as I could have picked other things, but I didn't, I must have been at some level choosing, even if I wasn't consciously aware of choosing at the time. And when you think about it, wow, you know, like that applies to probably 99 point 
7% of our choices in life are sort of like that, that we're really just, it seems like in the moment, we're just moving through the moments of our lives. But actually, when you reflect back upon it, we could have done that in any number of different ways. We could have different attitude toward it. We could have feel, felt different things if we decided we were going to feel it in a different way. We could have trained our perceptual field or focused our perceptual field in a somewhat different way as we were moving through that entire process. And insofar as there was actually a very broad range of options, a very broad uh, range of different possible ways we could have moved through the moments of our lives. At some level, even if we weren't aware of it, we must have been choosing the particular way that we did. So to select one out of a range of options means that at some level we were making choices even if we were not reflectively aware of doing so. So the vast majority of our choices are pre-reflective in nature. In other words, what you should be inferring is that uh, whether something qualifies as a choice or not in our lives is not dependent on our being consciously aware of it as a choice in our lives. See, this is a mistake that a lot of people make when they start getting into an analysis of freedom like this. They look at the instances of freedom that they're consciously aware of as choices, as if that were the entire range of our freedom. Well, from the point of view of Sartre's phenomenological analysis, not only is that not true, but actually the choices that we're aware of constitute just a tiny, tiny fraction of all of our choices. Because the fact of the matter is, we're always choosing. Even in this moment now, as you're watching this video, well, the fact of the matter is that you could have decided to click onto another video at any and all points. But if you're listening now, that means you've made it up to this point. And, uh, you know, even if you weren't aware of, well, I guess I'm choosing to continue to watch this video to get to this point in the, in the lecture, the fact of the matter is, insofar as at any point along here, you could have decided to turn this video off or turn on uh, some other video, I don't know, Justin Bieber, whatever your <laughs> sort of thing is, your taste, that wouldn't be my particular choice, but it could be yours. But the fact of the matter is I could wa uh, decide to watch a Justin Bieber at any point. Or I could decide to bring up Justin Bieber in the middle of a Sartre lecture, for that matter. Oh, wait a minute. I just did, even though I wasn't consciously aware of choosing to do that. You see how it illustrates the point? You get it? So freedom turns out to be, and choosing turns out to be, like way more pervasive, way more uh, permeating the moments of our lives than it seems like at first. So uh, freedom is everywhere, all the time. You're always choosing. At least you're choosing your attitude toward your facticities at every, each and every moment. So uh, Sartre writes a little quote. Students love it when you connect what you're saying with quotes from the book. So uh, man, okay, once again, a little bit of antiquated language, but man will be what he will have planned to be, not what he will want to be. In other words, sometimes your choices are at odds with what you think you want in life. Okay, so this is another point that a lot of the time we think that free our freedom is about choosing what we want. Well, the fact of the matter is some fraction of the time we choose exactly what we do not want. And this might remind you of Dostoevsky's analysis of our most advantageous advantage from Notes of the Underground. We covered that some lectures ago. I can't remember how many, but maybe eight or ten lectures ago. So uh, similar sort of point we find here in Sartre. So let's read that again. Man will be what he will have planned to be. In other words, when he says plan, that's a little bit of a, I think, an infelicitous choice of word words. So uh, by, by that, what he means is what you pre-reflectively choose to be, not which isn't necessarily what you want to be. All right, so we can choose things. In fact, we often choose things that are at odds with what we think we want in life. Because by the word will, we generally mean a conscious decision, which is subsequent to what we have already made of ourselves. Okay, so that may seem like a little abstract, but if you think about it in terms of this business of pre-reflective choice, I, better, I bet it'll start to make sense to you. Because by the word will, we generally mean a conscious decision, decisions that we're actually aware of as decisions, which is subsequent to, in other words, it comes after what we've already made of ourselves. In other words, most of our choices are pre-reflective, and when we think uh, that we're aware of what we're choosing, in a way, the pre-reflective choices have already come before that. Okay, so 
I think that's enough on uh, choice and hence freedom being mostly pre-reflective. Freedom is something that for the most part we're not aware of in, in the form of uh, its daily practice in the moments of our lives. Now, uh, the next bit is also <laughs> important and very famous. So the next segment of your notes has to do with something called bad faith and nausea or nausea, perhaps in French. So, um, uh, so the main, the main uh, point here has to do with uh, what we mostly do with our freedom. What, we do, what do we mostly do with the fact that we are radically free and, responsibility in the, uh, and responsible in this way? And uh, Sartre's answer to that is, the main thing we do with our freedom is pretend like we're not free. The main thing we do with our freedom is choose to believe that we're not free. And I'm slowing down on that so you can hear sort of the weird uh, loop in that. There's a sort of paradoxical twist in that. To choose to believe, to choose means that we're exercising our freedom, to believe that we're not free. So hopefully you're hearing the paradox that as an exercise of our freedom, a way of using our freedom, the main way we use our freedom is to act like we're not free. But that itself is a choice. So we don't get out of the condition of freedom by pretending, or more accurately, by choosing to pretend like we're not free. But that's the main thing we do. Now, he calls this bit of theater, if you're getting the sense that, wow, there's something theatrical about this or something dishonest about this, if we're choosing to pretend like we're not free, he calls this bad faith. Okay, so this is a very important um, phrase and idea in uh, Sartre's phenomenology. So the main thing we do with our freedom is we act like we're not free, and the other manifestation of bad faith that maybe we should talk about for a second is we make excuses for ourselves. Making excuses for ourselves is a way of pretending or at least diminishing our particular role and the role of our particular choices in the quality of life as we experience it. All right, so bad faith means making excuses for ourselves, generating a kind of theater for ourselves, and the point of that theater is to distract ourselves and help us believe that we're not actually as free as we really are. Okay, so the main thing we do with our freedom is run away from our freedom. And I'm saying the same thing about five times in a row because I think it needs to be said about five times in a row because this is so much running against the grain of our prevailing social practices and ethos uh, of our 21st century time. Uh, which is all about, I think, all about making excuses for ourselves and trying to find justifications for why we feel like victims and uh, trying to get the world to uh, make us happy in some sense when the deeper reality is if we're happy, it comes out of our own particular practice of freedom and our own particular way of owning responsibility for the quality of our lives. The world will continue to be the world whether we like it or not. If we make the world and what the world does uh, the source of our happiness, odds are we're not going to be very happy, or if we are, it'll be just sort of a random event that occurs every now and then. Uh, to really be happy, we really need to take the reins of the quality of our lives, but that's about the last thing uh, that our world encourages us to do these days. So I think it needs to be said a whole bunch of times in order to get it across. So uh, the one bit of facticity uh, that we do not choose with regard to our freedom is the condition of freedom itself. Okay, so the condition of being free one way of thinking about it is it's an element of facticity into which we are thrown. Okay, this is a little bit of Heideggerian language, but it, it's very apt for describing Sartre's ideas too. So uh, we're, here's his phrase, his way of saying it is we're condemned to freedom. And this might remind you a little bit of some language that we saw in Camus where the element of condemnation and the condemnation of Sisyphus more 
uh, specifically the proletarian of gods is, of the gods as Camus calls Sisyphus uh, is of course means that well it Sisyphus's condemnation is in so many ways a lot like our own and we went into a lot of detail about that in previous videos but uh, this theme of condemnation we find again in Camus contemporary Sartre so uh, it's a sort of a recurrent theme to an extent in existential thinking so uh, freedom is uh, something we're condemned to. Now, maybe at this point your question is, well, why would he say it in such a sort of dark, dismal, somewhat morbid way? Why wouldn't he say, well, you know, freedom is a picnic, like the wonderful, joyous picnic that we get to, uh, you know, get to eat wonderful food and uh, play frisbee at or something like that. Why is it a condemnation? Well, the reason why he thinks of it as a condemnation, there's a couple reasons, is that when it comes down to it, uh, there's something very dizzying and even nauseating about the condition of our freedom. And probably not in this video, but the next one, what I want to do is go through a whole bunch of uh, analyses that hopefully give you a sense for the actually nauseating character of our freedom. So part of the reason why we engage in bad faith so much and try to evade the reality of our freedom and make excuses for ourselves at all turns and try to regard ourselves as victims rather than free agents is because there's something just disorienting and excessive and nauseating about the condition of our free freedom itself. Now, this is a little bit counterintuitive with respect to especially American values because we love to extol the virtues of freedom and speak the language of freedom and the word liberty is on all of our money in case you haven't noticed. By the way, if you want to know what your culture's uh, central values are or at least the values that are supposedly your culture's central values, look at the money. Look at the money. So our money has the word liberty on it. And okay, so liberty is not exactly the same thing as freedom, but they definitely overlap to an extent. Uh, so from an American point of view, we like to talk the language of freedom and liberty and all of that kind of stuff. But uh, the fact of the matter is that we pretty much try to evade it at each and every point. Like we want to be free, but not that free. You getting it? Like we want a certain range of freedom and latitude and opportunities to choose and options and so on and so forth. But what we do not want is that deep, powerful, radical range of freedom that is actually our existential human birthright. That is something that we find, and rightly so, dizzying, nauseating, uh, vertiginous, and so on. You know, so. Um, Oh, vertiginous. Maybe that's a vocabulary word for you. So vertiginous means to produce vertigo. Okay, so it's sort of the adjectival form of the word vertigo. All right, so um, that's the first reason why we avoid uh, owning our freedom is because of the nauseating character. The second one's going to be the onerousness of our responsibility. Okay, that our responsibility for our choices and for the quality of our lives is way deeper and way weightier than most of us are comfortable with. Okay, so the dizzying character of freedom motivates bad faith, motivates the, the ongoing production of this kind of theater whose purpose is to deceive ourselves about the real fundamental nature of how free we really are and consequently how responsible for the quality of our lives we really are. Like we're so damn eager, I think especially in the 21st century, to pin the quality of our lives onto something other than ourselves. Like social dynamics, power dynamics, privilege dynamics, any number of factors, you know, but the last person we'll attribute the quality of our lives to is ourselves. But the fact of the matter is, if we want, if we really want to be empowered and not just sort of, uh, you know, sort of shift our power onto more or less arbitrary, more or less random happenings within the world, we have to start to own our freedom and we have to start to own our fundamental responsibility for the quality of our lives. So here again, I'd like to throw out this um, thought experiment to you in the spirit of Sartre's analysis. Um, what if the quality of life as you experience it, the main variable in that complex equation that determines the quality of life as you know it, is mostly about your choices and your ability to assume responsibility 
for the quality of your life. Suppose that were the main variable in the complex equation. There are many variables in that equation. A lot of them factical, a lot of them you don't necessarily have, you can choose by fiat, you know. But suppose that the main variable, the main determinant of whether your life feels like it's a high quality life or a low quality life is your actual choices and your ability to assume as much responsibility for your life as possible. Suppose you're way more powerful than you think you are. Suppose you're way more powerful than you even want to be. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, interesting sort of thing. But the, the good comes with the bad, as with most things in life, and so too with our freedom. And the bad is, if you're going to assume your rightful power in your life, you're going to have to learn to deal with a certain measure of disorientation, nausea, anxiety, and so on. And you're going to have to learn to carry weights that are heavier than maybe what you think you can carry. The weight, more specifically, of assuming responsibility for your life. But then again, you can always choose, because you're factically free, not to be powerful. You can always choose to act like a puppet or a robot, you know? And that's what we do most of the time. That's what bad faith is about. And it's a way of being dishonest with ourselves, dishonest with each other, and so on. But the fact that there's something dishonest and fundamentally theatrical about it does not mean that we don't do it. In fact, just the opposite. All right, so <laughs> let's see. Um, let's see, maybe that'll, I sort of want to do the next uh, chunk in its own video. So let's end this video here, okay? So I hope you're having a great day. We're supposed to get a bunch of storms here in Georgia and possibly tornadoes. So if there's a big gap between this video and the next one, uh, you know, you'll possibly know the reason why. Okay, but in any case, have a great day and uh, enjoy your tornadoes and enjoy your corona apocalypse and your encampment in a state of quarantine. All right, have a great day. Bye-bye.